So first off, thank you again for coming. Um, I really, really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to see my final presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna start off just by giving an overview of what I'll be talking about today. So I'm gonna be reflecting on how and why my thoughts and belief towards both teaching and learning have evolved in this past year. And then I'm gonna be I'm exploring and doing my reflection by looking at the lens of my essential question and how it's changed throughout the year. And I'll also share some of the provisional answers that I've gathered so far. And then at the end, I have a lot of people, um, which is you all, to appreciate. And I would love to take Denise and Sophie's idea and take a picture of you all like waving to the camera. Um, and then hopefully there's some room for you all to ask any questions or share any thoughts at the end. So um, this little emoji here, I just want to give like two quick disclaimers before I begin and say that this is not an all encompassing reflection. Um, I had a lot of struggle trying to figure out what to put in this presentation. And I decided to just reconcile with that tension by throwing this disclaimer and saying that this is just one sliver, um, a really fat sliver of my year, but it's not everything. And two, my current thoughts um, are not static or permanent. I just really wanna use this opportunity to reflect on how I think at the very beginning of my teaching journey, um, knowing full well that I'm gonna to continue to learn and unlearn um, as I move forward. So I wanna start off with these wise words from my student when I recently asked for feedback on how I can improve as a teacher. And one student said, work on explaining things more concisely. And I thought that was so funny and I laughed because there could not be a more appropriate piece of feedback for me. Um, for those of you who know me, I ramble a lot. And being concise is something that I've been working on for the past several years, but I'm not where I want to be. Um, so with that, I'm about to start a 100 slide presentation. <laughs> Just kidding, I cut it down to 92. So we're gonna hit rewind and we're gonna start in 2005. So this is me on my 10th birthday and I included this picture here because um, when I was 10 my favorite game to play was school um, and this is my cousin Jonathan who is in here. Um, he is now he's turning 21 soon but every time he would come over on the weekends I would always make him play school with me where I was the teacher and I would just come up with random lesson plans and activities. Um, one of them being to create an award and give it to someone. And I'm not sure if he was forced to do this, but he gave this award to me. And he said, Katrina is a good teacher because she teaches us a lot of things. And I thought this was funny to put in here, but also a really good representation of the skewed mentality that I had for so long about what a good teacher was. Um, I think growing up, I just thought that a good teacher was someone who knew a lot and who was very smart and an expert at whatever it is they were teaching. Um, and just knew everything. And because that was what I had envisioned as a good teacher, as I grew older and um, my experience in like subject classes wasn't so hot, I grew more and more insecure about my ability to be a good teacher. And I felt like um, because of that, I kept straying away from wanting to teach in K through 12 schools. And I get really emotional every time I talk about that. But um, I use this to just share that this is kind of the mentality I, that I had up until I came here um, to TEP. And so we're going to time jump, a super big time jump now to the first day of orientation last summer. Um, Dr. V had us create these acrostic poems uh, and we were just to share like um, some background about us. So I wrote about my family and I'll just talk a little bit about my background because I feel like it really shaped the person and educator I am today. Um, so my family, my grandparents, um, parents, they're from Vietnam, but um, they're ethnically Chinese and they are refugees from the Vietnam War. And then they immigrated here in 1979 and I was born and raised in Rosemead, um, which is like on the outskirts of LA. And a little bit about Rosemead, um, the demographics of Rosemead, is like 60% Asian, primarily um, Chinese or Vietnamese coming from like Southeast Asia and 40% Latinx, um, primarily families coming from Mexico. So um, as you can imagine, the community that I grew up in was not very representative of the like world outside of Rosemead. 
Um, so I was very much in this bubble, didn't really know what was going on. And even when I went to college at UC Irvine, which is like an hour south of Rosemead, I was still very much in a bubble. And it wasn't until one education class that really changed my trajectory and shifted me back on the path towards K through 12 teaching. And that was multicultural education um, in K through 12 schools. And in that space, I was really given the opportunity to reflect on my own privilege um, and my own lack of awareness and exposure and experience. Um, and that's where I first started hearing like social justice terms. And I thought that class was transformational, but at the end of the quarter, I just felt like I only scratched the surface and I didn't really know the next steps. Um, so when I was looking into TEP programs, I really wanted to look for programs that had a social justice agenda so that I can continue um, doing the work and learning more. So that brings me um, here to Harvard and I was so, so anxious. Um, my insecurity and like imposter syndrome was at an all time high and now being coupled with being thrown out of every comfort zone I was in, moving out of SoCal for the first time. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at. And so one of the texts that we first read really resonated with me. It's Paulo Freire's Letters to Those Who Dare to Teach. And this is his, his excerpt on courage. And so I just wanna read a bit of it to you. And he talks about how fear is a manifestation of our being alive. I do not need to hide my fears, but I must not allow my fears to immobilize me. Hence the need to be in control of my fear, to educate my fear from which is finally born my courage. And that is why though there may be fear without courage, the fear that devastates and paralyzes us, there may never be courage without fear. And I remember, um, I think I was with Adam and Sophie and maybe Casey um, when we were choosing like which corner to go into. And I remember just, we were all sharing about why we were scared and I felt so relieved and comforted knowing that I wasn't alone and even though our fears looked very different um we were all feeling very scared so I was very filled with anxieties um a lot of the things that were on my mind at that time were am I Harvard material uh do I even belong here like I'm gonna like everybody around me seems so much smarter and so much more experienced they're much better speakers than I am um, will I be a good teacher? Will I connect to my students? Am I the only one scared of CHSA? Because I felt uh, that's the summer school program that they start us off in. And without any prior training, they just like throw us into the classroom. And I was freaking out about it. Um, but everybody seemed so excited. And so I always wondered, was I the only one like terrified? And then this one, will I be seen as this little Asian girl? I think um, I'm still grappling with like where I fit in as an Asian American when um, where my voice fits in and what often seems to be like this racial binary. Um, so those are just kind of thoughts that I have. And is it okay if I no don't know so much about social justice? So these were at the forefront of my mind and I felt like they really drove my first essential question. And our essential question, we're all asked to come up with a question that we wanna investigate that will drive um, our practice. And it's a question that doesn't have a definitive answer. So even if you start to find answers, there's always more to um, research and dig deeper into. So the very first um, question that I had was, how to be an effective social justice educator when you don't look like your students and or your students don't look like those in the curriculum? And looking back at this, it's not my essential question now, but it just really is a good reflection of all the anxieties that I had back in June. Um, and then it kind of just like went out the door and I didn't think about it once we started CHSA. So I was in this classroom, US1, with Nadia, Joy, and Marshall, and I just poured myself into creating the lessons. Um, and I was trying to draw as much as I can to make my lessons as engaging as I could and colorful, um, created analogies to try to make the civil war and sectionalism easier to understand. Um, and I thought I was being very innovative. And then I got uh, feedback from one of my mentors. And it said, it is necessary to boost the rigor of your initial brainstorms and be sure that you're utilizing a standards-based and skill-focused approach to teaching rather than pushing forward with an activity that might sound fun or engaging. You seem to be most comfortable designing lessons where the teacher lectures and tells the story of history. I challenge you to have students uncover these histories and make meaning of history through reading, writing, speaking, and listening to each other. And 
this was a really grounding piece of feedback. Um, and it made me think a lot about why it was that I just so naturally gravitated towards lecturing. Um, I actually hadn't even considered an alternative approach to teaching history. And another text that we read in the summer really allowed me to understand why that was. So this is Christopher Emden's um, For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood and the rest of y'all too. And he says that the way a teacher teaches can be traced directly back to the way that the teacher has been taught. And the time will always come when teachers must ask themselves if they will follow the mold or blaze a new trail. There are serious risks that come with this decision. It essentially boils down to whether one chooses to do damage to the system or to the student. And so that made me just reflect on the reason why I lectured was because I've always been lectured too. I'm um, in middle school and high school, in college, and even my discussion sections in college were little lectures. Um, and so it was very obvious why I chose to go with lecturing because it was really all that I knew. And another um, book or another piece of text that we read in the summer helped me name that kind of education that I was getting. And I learned that I was a product of the banking method of education. So Paulo Freire's um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed says that in the banking system of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. Um, and I think there's, I don't think lecturing is inherently bad. And I think Chad's presentation reminded me that so many of us benefited from this model of education. Um, but I think this illustration down here does a good job in showing the potential harms of the banking method of education. Um, as you can see, this teacher is just stripping away the student's um, ability to critically think, their creativity, their individuality, as she's just pouring into them what she knows to be true. Um, and I, one moment in summer school that made me really think about this was when I was just lecturing on and on about a civil war or something. And then I asked my students, like, does that make sense? And one of the students said, well, yeah, we've been learning this stuff since seventh grade. And that really made me just step back and um, reflect on the fact that even though I knew that this was summer school and all these students had taken this class during the year, um, I didn't even ask them, like, what do you know about this subject before diving into 40 straight minutes of me lecturing? So that was a moment for me to really try to reflect on how I can shift my practice. Um, but then I was like, okay, well, if it's not the banking, then what is it? And another piece of text in our summer readings said that what we want to do is shift towards a student-centered approach. And a student-centered approach is one that transforms the learning into a space where students' voice, knowledge, experiences, and other assets are centralized and amplified. And this shift is liberating because all participants become teachers and students. So when I read this, I underlined it and I highlighted it and said, okay, this is what I want to do. But like many of the readings that we've done, it just sounded so abstract to me. And I, I wrote, well, what does a student-centered lesson plan actually look like? Um, and then I, I found that answer thanks to Noel Reyes, my methods instructor. So in the summer and fall, um, he taught us how to effectively lesson plan to unit plan and essentially boiled it down to these steps. Um, and it always has to start with that standards-based and skill-based objective. Um, and I remember hearing my high school teachers talk about going to PSYOP trainings where they're like having, like being asked to put objectives on the wall and they thought it was very silly and a waste of time. Um, but I finally realized the purpose and the impact of having a, an objective um, because it really gives your lesson purpose and it allows you, if you do it correctly, to ensure that you are not producing um, a 50 minute lecture. And I hadn't even realized until the end of fall when Noel tied it back to the banking method of education. And he said, when you do these five steps and you do this um, correct sequence to lesson planning, you have already ensured that you're moving away from that banking method of education because you will have ensured that your lesson is liberate, liber, liberatory. I don't know, liberating, liberating, there you go. <laughs> Um, so for me, that was like a mind blowing moment where I finally saw the connection between theory and practice. And so thank you, Noel. Um, 
And I just wanted to put this picture here because this is me on the last day of CHSA. And this is um, like a poster where I drew a picture of each of our eight students and I just put a little bit of their interest around it. And this was an important moment for me because we had given them the drawing and then like a card and their folder of work that they did all summer. And so many of the students took that folder of work and they just threw it in the recycle bin. And then they kept only the drawing and the card. And it was just a good reminder to me that students really care about like how much you value them and showing that you know them and care about them and I'm really happy to see that they took those drawings even the students that did not like our class all summer. Um, so now we're in the fall and I was given my placement at an AP US history class at CRLS and I was just filled with a new set of anxieties. Um, I had already not felt confident in history, and now I just felt so unqualified to be teaching AP history. Um, again, I was wondering, will they like me? Will they connect with me? Uh, will they even see me as an authority figure, as like a five foot two petite high school looking girl? Um, I was thinking like, crap, I don't even know the answer to these questions or these essay prompts. I'm not even comfortable with primary sources. Um, how am I gonna manage the classroom and how am I gonna work with my mentor? So, when we were asked to revisit our essential question again in September, I looked back at the one that I created in June and it just didn't seem to fit with what I really wanted to investigate. And instead there was one line from my June exit ticket that sounded a lot more like what I actually wanted to do. And that was to, so my second um, rendition of my question was, what are specific ways I can build community and engage students critically in learning about themselves, each other, the content, and how it relates to their future and you know, their world and future? Um, and as you can imagine, this is a really ambitious question and it's not gonna remain um, as my essential question throughout because it was just way too much. I was trying to do too much. But nonetheless, that was the question that I went into the school year with. And at first, it seemed really great because the first two weeks of school was all about community building. Um, we asked students to uh, write us a letter. We had them play a name game. Um, we asked them about, to create an expression of self, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, we gave them surveys to find out about their interests, their extracurriculars, how they study, if they want us to buy any um, supplies for them, and every single student went around saying their family migration story. Um, so here is just some expression of self and that acrostic poem that I recreated for them. And we turned the walls from these very empty, uh, sad, lonely walls to these very colorful walls filled with our students' identities. Um, and it always made me happy. And these are some self-timer photos I took after school on the good days. Um, but then week three hit and we really needed to start pushing with curriculum because we were already behind at that point. And with an AP class, we really need to prep our students for the exam. So we started to shift our priorities and I didn't see any more time being dedicated to community building. So at the same time, um, I was taking a lot of classes at Hugsy in the fall at Harvard, and one of the classes was Ethnic Studies with Dr. B, and a book we read was A Different Mirror by Ronald Takaki. And one of the quotes that stood out to me was, um, sometimes the people of multicultural America are hesitant to speak, thinking they were only little people. And I had annotated in the book, I remember I wrote like grandma, um, because I, I know that this happens, um, for my grandparents. And I've heard my grandma say, like, I don't know why anyone would wanna listen to what I have to say because I didn't even go to school. I didn't even like work. And ultimately I've seen this in myself too. Um, even with this presentation, okay. Even with this presentation, I felt so hesitant to even invite my friends and family um, because I was scared that like, I don't know, my story wasn't significant enough or um, it wouldn't be like what they expected that I was doing here. And so I just felt really um, vulnerable and, and hesitant to invite them. Um, but in the end, I am really glad I did and I'm really thankful that they're here and you all are here with me. But um, I knew that that was the case. And the reason why this ties back to my class and my central question is because um, so this is a reflection that I actually wrote in November in the Essential Questions session with Paul Trader, and I wrote that my mentor and I often talk about how the AP class is so restricting and how we are constantly perpetuating this dominant master narrative of history. Um, we 
started with migration stories and expression of self, but I don't think we've made too much of an effort to continue learning about students on a larger scale. Oops. Uh, recently, we asked students to critique the textbook and some students said, yeah, I never saw anything about Bangladesh in the textbooks. And I don't want these activities um, where we're learning about them to only come in at the beginning of the year. I want them to continue sharing their thoughts, um, their goals, ideas, and histories throughout the entire year. So I changed my question again, and this is the question that I am sticking with um, until today, and it is, in what ways can I make space for students to share, learn from, and connect to one another through their own stories? So with this new question, I started to reflect on the ways that spaces were created for me this year to share my own story. Um, and I know I already talked about the acrostic poem we did. Um, we did that again in ethnic studies. In methods, we started with this five picture introduction um, where we were supposed to choose five pictures and just tell the story of us. And of course, I cannot choose just five. So instead, I turned it into five slides and just tried to stuff as many slides as I could, or as pictures as I could in the slides. Sorry, we got some. Yeah. <laughs> And then in T550, um, many of you know that in Design for Learning by Creating, this class allowed us to create pretty much anything we wanted for our final project. So I used that opportunity to create a book of poems um, about my grandparents. And I wrote these poems from the perspective of them throughout like different points in their life. And for me, this is hands down the most meaningful um, project I've ever done for school. And it meant a lot to me. Um, to be able to create this, like to give tribute to my grandparents and also my parents and my aunts and uncles because their stories are very much in this book as well. And I also felt like I was giving them a voice um, because these are just not all stories that they tell, but they're just things that I've learned through conversations with them, through my observations. And I do think that I did portray their story um, quite accurately in my poems. And um, and I think this is me showing them when I went back for winter break. And even though I don't think they truly understood like what it was about, I think it meant a lot to them to see their faces um, and their stories on a piece of text. And I know this because I've felt that way this year for the first time where in ethnic studies class in the textbook, um, I read the history of Chinese Vietnamese immigrants um, coming from the Vietnam War. And that was the first time I saw my family's history in in a textbook and I just started crying when I was reading it. And so I just really wanna be able to create um, those opportunities for my students as well to feel the same way, to feel that they are being reflected in the classroom. And so that kind of ties into why do student stories matter? And going back to theory, um, students, so this is also a quote by these kids are out of control. Um, it says, students loved the sense of agency they had in their classroom, where from the outset, they knew their voices mattered. A student-centered classroom environment honors the voices of everyone within it, and it positions the teacher as a facilitator of the learning space and centers, not marginalizes, students' cultures, knowledge, lived experiences, interests, and want, wants and needs in a way that are deeply engaging and provide agency for students to take ownership over their own learning. So that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to make my students know that they mattered and their voice mattered um, and that they were valued. So, okay. Um, so now this kind of starts the evidence portion of my presentation. Let me just check the time. Okay, it's been 24 minutes. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the ways we created spaces for their stories in class and then how we try to continue doing that online. And finally, I'm going to end with just um, a survey that I gave to my students to ask for their perspective on my story. And yeah, so let's jump right in. So hello, that's the first thing that you'll see on our agenda all the time. We're, we um, make sure de to dedicate um, a time to just say hello to every single student that walks in. Um, and then we just do this casual check in with everybody to see if, like, if we have any updates, that's where we say it. If they have any updates, that's where we just get to have a casual um, check-in before we jump into the content. Classroom Kahoot. Uh, so at the beginning of the year and each semester, each student would go around saying their name and something about themselves. And then I wrote everything down and created that into a Kahoot. And I think this was a really fun way for them to learn about each other and um, start the school semester. 
and then making history. So whenever my students see this clock on the board, they, they know what's up. Um, in the beginning of second semester, we gave every student a notebook, and this is their making history notebook. And my mentor framed it um, by asking, what does it mean when we make history? And a lot of students said, oh, it's when someone does something life-changing, when they do something really good or really bad. Um, but he said that making history is anything that is recorded, um, whether it's big or small, life-changing or not. Um, anything that is recorded becomes history. And so we give them five minutes a day to write whatever they want. Um, they could draw, they could write, scribble. And we never collect these notebooks. We never even read them. Um, they're just for them and their future self and whoever they decide to bless with this notebook in the future with. Um, and I think this has really created a space for them to know that whatever it is they want to write is important. And this is something we, we continue to do during online learning as well. Every day we spend five minutes um, projecting this clock on the screen for them to journal. My good old Google Forms, um, I, I, I like create so many and <laughs> give it to my students. I really love creating space for them to share their feedback, thoughts, ideas, and feelings, whether it's when we're pushing out a new protocol for the first time, or if I'm lecturing and I want to know what they want me to review or how I'm doing. Um, when I had to do observations for other teachers, I asked them what, what teachers they recommended me, and almost every student recommended one of their history teachers to me, and I went to his classroom, and it was it was the best. I mean, it was great. And then I also went to some of their other classes too, and it was great to see them in a different setting. Um, and I think it's so important because students know so much, and I'm going to touch on this a little later, that they are really the experts of their own experience. Um, and this is just one of the surveys that I put after my very first lecture. And I thought it was just so poignant because every single thing, uh, every single student said that they wanted me to slow down and they wanted to take more like more time to take notes and so since then every time I do a lecture I always project the slide first for a little bit have them take notes before I start talking um, and I would have never known to do that had I not asked for their feedback um, another thing we did was to paint the walls with stories so during Black Lives Matter week in February um, my mentor and I started off with a discussion where we just kind of opened it up and we gave them a packet with the 13 guiding principles. And ultimately, we did not feel very good about how the discussion went. And we felt like it, it didn't really get the message we were trying to send across and it almost felt gimmicky. Um, so that night we kind of set up a plan to try again the next day. So I came back to school the next day and before third period, I made 13 posters um, and we put them around the wall and we really wanted them to be able to put their own experiences and understanding of these guiding principles on the wall as well. And this is something we continue to do every day um, during Making History. They were given the chance to do this. It was completely optional. And then um, each day they could add something new on the wall and it is still up on the walls today. So this is something that went beyond that week. And I just wanted to show you some of the things, um, some of the things that are on the wall. So we also attached like a quote and then these are just some of the wonderful things. Um, had I known schools would close, I would have taken a picture of all of them, but these are just some of the ones that I took. Um, another way that I tried to allow them to speak their thoughts and relate their stories was to connect it back to the stories that we're diving into in history. Um, so for my lesson on the Japanese internment camps, I collected a bunch of primary sources, um, pictures, quotes, diary entries, and I put them on blank poster boards. And I had students just annotate whatever it was they felt or thought as they were looking at these sources. Um, and as you see, like they found ways to relate. So in this picture here, um, the women are playing volleyball and a lot of my students are in volleyball. So a lot of them, they were like, check, check, check. This one here is Stanley Hayami's diary entry. Um, he wrote a lot about his grades and one of my students put, I could see myself writing that, hashtag relatable. So I thought this was a really fun and good way for them to kind of see themselves um, in these stories and also um, really engage with the material. And then at the end of that class, I was able to remind them of just how well they practiced that tenant of empathy that was on the walls because everything that they put on there was something that they exemplified um, in that lesson. And so I thought it was just a really great way to connect everything. 
And then we were hit with COVID-19 and we had to go online. And at first it was very confusing with what our curriculum would look like because we didn't know what the AP exam would look like. Um, so I gave them a survey and asked them, well, what is your vision moving forward? Because we really want this curriculum to be something that benefits you. And if you see, almost every single student wanted to review for the AP exam, um, which is, we call it the dragons in our class. But once we got that, I asked them, okay, so what do you want to review? And what kind of review would be effective for you? Um, and basically I used all of that feedback to inform the calendar that I created. So the online curriculum that we had was directly a response to the feedback that they gave me. Um, and my students are such rock stars. The school a couple weeks later said that you only need to meet with each class once a week. Um, but because they were so dedicated to the exam, they said, can we still meet every day? So we, Denise was there too. Um, we still met every single day for that hour prepping for the exam. And then I wanted to utilize social media, um, trying to create like a teacher Instagram, something I've always wanted to do. And school closure allowed me to expedite that plan. So I decided to create a teacher Instagram and use it to try to help them in any way that I could. Um, so they interacted and they said that they would love to do like random review stories or cahoots. And so that's what I did. Um, I utilized all the features of IG story and tried to come up with ways to quiz them on the sections that they wanted extra review in, um, give them little tips of how to remember things. I also explained things that they might have been confused about or was able to share uh, questions that multiple people had. And then we did cahoots. Um, thank you to Ms. Ban who shared with me her cahoots. And another thing that I did, so um, going off like of the drawings that I did in summer and just seeing how much my students enjoyed that, I wanted to write personalized cards for my students as well. And I am really sad that I'm not able to give them in person, but um, once I'm done, I have 23 out of 35 done. I'm gonna mail it out to each of their houses. Um, and I just drew them and then kind of put some interest or their culture or like uh, quotes that they liked. And I, this was a way that I actually backwards designed, I guess, um, pulling evidence for my essential question because I realized that I knew all these things about them, but I kind of was like, how do I know these things? And then I went, oh, it's like the survey from the beginning of the year or like the feedback things. And so that was how I was able to pull evidence. Um, but this is something that I also put on Instagram. And then um, something that I felt was a really valuable way to, sorry, I looked at the clock and I don't know where I was going with that sentence. But another thing that I did, um, we did me and Denise together was, put a survey together asking about their online or their thoughts about online learning. And this is a quote from Denise's Facebook status that just reminded us all that we have such a great opportunity here to rethink schools um, and how we can improve it to best suit all of our students' needs and to use this time to learn from them as they are the experts of their own experience and they know what's best for them. So, I'm not putting all of their feedback, but I just wanted to put some things that I felt um, were important for us as educators and just students and people to think about. So some positives about online learning, um, by far, a lot of them said it was freedom of schedule and flexibility, which I can definitely agree with. And what do they miss the most right now? Most of them said their friends and that personal interaction with friends and teachers. How do they think that COVID-19 slash online learning has shifted their perspective on school? Um, so a lot of them talked about this newfound appreciation for school, um, realizing now that it's a privilege to go to school. And a lot of them are also questioning, well, what's the purpose of school? If we can learn everywhere, what is the purpose of school? Um, a lot of them just kind of talked about how they're, they're trying to reflect on their, their view of school. And then this one I think is really important. Um, it's what would you want next year's teachers to know about you? And a lot of them talked about how they felt like they needed that extra time to review and readjust next year um, if we are back. Uh, they talked a lot about fear, anxiety, stress, and hoping that their teacher will know how dedicated they are despite like the stressful situation they were in. And I think this is so important because veteran teachers, new teachers alike, we're all faced with this unprecedented situation. And I think it's really um, important to be mindful that our students missed out on a huge chunk of school this year. And um, how can we welcome them back in a classroom in a way that is um, 
inviting and also really careful to give them what they need um, because of what has happened during this time. So now we're in April, our last essential question session with Paul Tritter, and I was reflecting on my question, and I had realized um, that I forgot about these two parts. Like I realized there were three parts of it, but I thought, okay, I definitely made spaces for students to share their stories. But the other part, learning from and connecting with each other, I wasn't so sure because we didn't really do like discussions or I just didn't feel like we went that extra step to have them connect to each other. Um, so I was about to end it here and just say, okay, I didn't answer all of my question, but then I decided to give my students one last survey. Um, and my first questions were asking them what they thought about um, whether or not I created spaces for them to share their stories and specifically in what ways, and then if I did the same and allowed them opportunities to learn and connect to their classmates. So to my, like aligning with the evidence that I had just pulled, a lot of them felt that they were given space to share their own stories. Um, and I didn't put them all <laughs> to cut down the slides, but um, most of them were the things that I had also said, that beginning of the class greeting, right, starting conversations, asking questions and following up with students, allowing them to share their thoughts and feedback, uh, facilitating student discussion during lessons. Some of them said even like mid-lesson, she would just ask for our feedback. Um, making history and connecting to the Black Lives Matter principles. But one of them that I hadn't thought about at all was this one up here that says not forcing students to speak. Um, so two students talked about how because I didn't force them to speak and because we don't have any like cold calling or random calling generator, um, they felt more comfortable knowing that they could participate whenever they wanted to and because of that they participated more than they did in other classes. Um, and again another student said that I never made them feel pressured to say anything which made them feel more safe to do so. Um, so then now that second part, learning and connecting, uh, to my surprise, one more person voted five for this one, but still everybody agreed or strongly agreed that they learned about their peers. And um, so I asked, well, what ways did you do that? <laughs> and so they said group work, um, as they were working in groups, they were able to learn about each other. Um, open conversations related and unrelated to the content, whether it was before, during, or after class. A lot of them talked about how they felt that I initiated the share out of personal stories. Um, so this one says like, whenever we have a class discussion about something personal or important, um, Ms. Yip wouldn't be afraid to start it, which made me feel safe and pushed me to be able to talk about my experience, experiences or emotions. And this reminded me of just how important it is to be vulnerable as a teacher. And then um, this one was surprising to me and delightful to see that the cards on Instagram allowed them to connect with each other. Um, and they were saying that it allows us to see the similar hobbies or just like whatever interest, culture, quotes that their peers liked. Um, and I hadn't even realized that. Um, so many of them, they like, you know, play the same sports or they like the same things. And all of these things are stories that they shared in class that um, I think students were just able to learn a lot more every time they would see me post. So thanks to my students, I realized that, yay, I did find provisional answers to all parts of my question. Um, and I just wanted to leave myself and you all with some pieces of advice that they gave me. Um, so one of my survey questions was, what piece of advice do you have for Ms. Yip? And one of them said, keep letting students know you care about them. Check in on them if you see someone not doing so well so they know that someone sees them, but also check in on them if they look fine as well. Keep smiling and be cheerful. Um, it made a huge difference because most of my teachers are grumpy all the time and it makes me grumpy too. And it just reminds me how far a smile can go. And this one I just felt really spoke to me. Um, be yourself, be confident in your abilities as a teacher. You got this. Don't give up on people and everyone has a story. And without even knowing my personal story or my essential question, this student just tied everything up so perfectly. Um, and so with that, I wanna go back to this award. And I think that now if I were to ever receive award of being a good teacher, I would hope that the reason is because rather than being able to teach a lot of things, it's because I am open to always learning a lot of things um, and that I'm a forever learner. And I'm now just left with um, some lingering thoughts and questions. So as I said, I didn't feel like we really facilitated um, 
discussions. So I kind of am thinking about how can I facilitate intentional and meaningful group discussions in the classroom? Thinking about those students who talked about not being forced, I'm thinking about how can I strike a balance between creating a comfortable environment for all students while encouraging growth? And what role does class size play in community building? Because I only had 35 students between two classes, but I imagine when I have like six periods with 30 students each, um, things would look a little different. All right, so I'm gonna try to just speed through my appreciations, but I just wanna thank all my students from summer, fall semester, um, spring semester. They have taught me so much and brought me so much joy um, and they continue to do so. I'm so glad that I have a lot of them on Instagram. To my mentor, Marlon, um, he has, thank you for welcoming me into your classroom and for teaching me that teaching is an iterative practice and that even after 19 years, there are going to be mistakes that are made, but the best thing to do is just to be vulnerable and honest with your students and just come back and try again the next day. To Noel, my methods instructor, um, thank you so much for teaching me everything I know about lesson planning. Uh, it's amazing when I reflect back on all the things that I've learned from you this year. To Beth, I'm sorry, Beth too though, I didn't include her here, but thank you so much Beth, she's the one that ran CHSA. But to Dr. V and Susan, um, really the foundation of our cohort, um, you both created the family that we have today and I'm so grateful for everything that you both do. To my advisor, Ariel, thank you so much for your insightful feedback and for always pushing me to look at the bigger picture and think about my future classroom. And to Paul Trader, this is a super old picture I found online for hosting all those sessions on Saturday to have us reflect on our experience. And to my cohort, I won't say so much now, but it has been the biggest pleasure and honor to be able to have been on this journey with you all. And um, you all lifted me so much. I've learned so much from every single one of you. And I am so, so sad that um, our journey together here is ending, but I really hope that we still stay in contact and have breakfast club alumni things. <laughs> Special shout out to the history method cohort um, and my co-teachers, Joy and Nadia in the summer. Uh, we went through so much, but I'm, I wouldn't have chosen two other people to go through it with. And to Denise who hopped on during um, last minute with the whole COVID situation and just was a rock star and a trooper with me um, finishing out practicum. Um, and then to Noor, to Ruth, to the camping girls, to the CRLS family, thank you so much for just being there, checking in on me, um, supporting me, and just being a part of this journey with me. To Ryan, uh, my boyfriend who is right there, um, thank you so much for all the sacrifices that you've made, for literally, um, you know, leaving your family, quitting your job, moving across the country, coming here with like nothing yet, um, waking up at whatever time to make me breakfast and lunch, coming to my presentations to see my students, um, running to school to give me my phone when I left it and the office called me saying, your boyfriend is downstairs. So just thank you for being such the biggest support. Um, thank you to Ms. Ban, my high school teacher who has been with me as a mentor this year and for the past 10 years and is always guiding me and giving me the resources that I can share with my students. And she just like emailed me a bunch of job postings too earlier. To my friends, um, a lot of them who are here now, thank you so much for checking in with me, for reading my many, many <laughs> posts, um, and just for being there supporting me through the years. And to my family, um, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, um, it's the greatest blessing of my life to be in this family and to call you all family, and thank you so much. And lastly, to my parents and my sister um, for always supporting this teaching dream of mine. And even if it's just like three thumbs up, um, it means the world to me. And I'm so glad to have their love and support. Okay, I'm done. And Denise told me to not talk so long, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And so I'm done now. Okay, so yes. Unmute and cheer for her, because that was incredible. <laughs> Yay! Katrina! Yay! Wonderful! Thank you.